So welcome to, to this panel on um, crafting collegiality in competitive contexts. For those who don't know me, I'm Marcel Dawson and I work in the sociology department at Otago and together with Sophie Bond and Karen Nair, we coordinate the um, uh, early career and postgraduate network for ESOC SCI. Um, so yeah, I got a critique from one of my colleagues this morning who thought that my um, alliteration was over the top. <laughs> But yes, crafting collegiality in competitive context. I thought it was sort of a, a very opportune moment to talk about um, this. Uh, many of you would have seen in the papers all the stuff that's going on at Otago, and I'm sure you've had this at your own universities too. Um, and we've also seen a lot of scholarship um, that's quite critical of universities in, in the 21st century. And so I want, what I wanted to do was have this discussion um, on what collegiality means. Because I think often we uh, hear the word being mentioned. Most often we hear people being uncollegial. And I'm not really sure we have a common understanding of, of what that means, how it has maybe changed in today's universities. Um, and I'm very pleased to, to have a, a fantastic lineup today, um, whom I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the speakers and then we can kick off with uh, a few thoughts on this panel. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Wendy Lana to this discussion. Big <laughs> wave from, from Wendy. Um, many of you will, will know Wendy through her work on globalization, governance and gender, but also beyond um, her intellectual efforts, Wendy's held uh, high level administrative positions at a range of universities within and also beyond New Zealand. Um, Wendy is also the provost at Victoria University in Wellington, or are we now the University of Wellington? Or oh, fine. Um, <laughs> we are, can't remember where we are with that discussion. <laughs> but importantly also, Wendy is the new president of the uh, Royal Society Te Aparangi. And we're very pleased to have her here. Wendy's very committed to, as many of you know, to um, the, the efforts of early career scholars. And in, in particular, some of you might have caught her interview on Radio New Zealand. So we're very pleased to have Wendy here. We also have Dr. Graydon Diprose in the center of my screen, big way from Graydon. Uh, Graydon is senior lecturer at Massey uh, in Wellington. He's no stranger to the ESOC size screen. Um, Graydon has a PhD in human geography and is conducting research on climate adaptation, vulnerability, mm -hmm. and community well being. And Right on my uh, right hand side, we have Dr. Kim Brown, who's recently completed a PhD topic right in this area that we'll be talking about today. The title of her PhD through the College of Education was Developing an Understanding of Collegial Peer Learning During Doctoral Education. And uh, Kim currently works as a professional practice fellow and assistant research fellow at the Graduate School here at the University of Otago. So I'm very pleased to have all three people on, on board. I think they'll bring some really interesting perspectives to this discussion. Right, so without any further ado, I, I, I've, I've mentioned to the presenters some key themes that we want to touch on, but please, if you do have questions, please do, do um, jump in. Um, I'll try to keep my eye on the, the screen. Um, I thought what I'd do, given Wendy, your in, incredible experience, um, uh, you know, across time and space in, involved in, in universities, I thought I might turn to you and, and ask about, um, you know, this, this, the nature of competition in the academy. Is it much to do about nothing? Do we, you know, uh, there's, there's been a lot of critique, also a lot of scholarship about the nature of competition in the academy. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Has it changed in terms of the intensity or the type? Um, if you could comment on on the sort of d the dimensions and degree of competition that you've experienced um, across the areas where you've worked. Okay, so I'm going to begin by making two points that I think are contextual points that might be kind of help frame the wider discussion. I think the the first point is one that has. Uh, become much more a feature of our sector uh, in recent years. The academy has globalised. So we are a globalising sector, and what that means is that we are part of a globalising academic labour market. 
Now, one of the consequences of that is that the world is now producing way more PhD students than will ever get academic jobs. Yeah. Now, we don't have the data here in New Zealand, but I'll just put a, a little bit of international data out there to, to help set the scene. Uh, there was a study done in the US in the late 2000s they produced over 100,000 doctoral degrees and there were 16,000 new tenure track academic jobs. 100,000, 16,000. Uh, even in the Canadian context where the PhD cohorts haven't grown so dramatically, a similar kind of study, close to 5,000 doctorates, but only two and a half thousand full-time tenure track jobs. It has been a more common experience in some disciplines than others for quite a long time. So in chemistry, for example, uh, it's been quite common for people with PhDs to go into industry, to go into private sector jobs. Uh, that's been happening for a long time. But the point that I'm trying to make is that that is now happening right across the disciplinary spectrum and more and more early career folks are going to find themselves building their careers outside of the traditional roles in the traditional organisations. It's only in a very small number of countries now, uh, Brazil and China come to mind, where there's actually a shortage of PhD graduates to go into full-time academic jobs. So the point I'm making is that we have a structural shift that's a really important part of the context within which we're having this conversation. The second point I wanted to make by way of a scene-setting provocation point, if you like, is that while we hear an awful lot about competitiveness and individualism, both in the academic literature, but also in the conversations we have within our university, I really want to contest the fact or the idea that that's the kind of person that we need to be in today's academy. In fact, quite the contrary, there is, and some of you have heard me talk about this before, I think we're seeing a decided shift away from what we might have thought of as the neoliberal university, we could talk for hours on that, but I won't, to what we at uh, the to be renamed University of Wellington call the Global Civic University. Now, a Global Civic University requires us to work collaboratively in all aspects of the academic role. So in the research space, for example, there's a lot of talk about the rise of the Grand Challenge research environment, the rise of multidisciplinarity, the rise of cross-sectorial research teams at both the national and the international level. In the teaching environment, much greater emphasis on pedagogical innovation, team teaching, uh, new teams of educators coming together around uh, program development and curriculum delivery. I'm particularly interested at the moment of the rise of this new profession called learning designers, for example. And then thirdly, in the engagement sphere, a sphere that, again, all universities are taking much more seriously now, the ability to work across sectors is absolutely crucial to be successful in that space. So this is my second point, that in order to be successful in today's academy, uh, uh, and in today's uh, academic labour market, collaboration is absolutely at the heart of the kinds of subjectivities that we need to be cultivating. Great. Thank you so much, Wendy. I think that that sort of sets the scene quite nicely with those two provocations, one sort of the, the, the consequences of the doctoral glut, and, and then also this idea... Um, you know, not getting sucked into this negativity spiral and recognizing uh, the incredible space that we do have and how we can work across different sectors as, as being ultimately very important to success in the academy. Um, 
Great. And I might turn to you now as somebody sort of, you know, at an early, early career stage, having recently shifted um, institutions, you might want to touch on some of the, the things that Wendy has spoken about, but also talk about your own experience um, in this regard. Great. Thanks, Marcel. Um, yeah, Wendy, thanks for those points. I think they really resonate with my own experiences over kind of the last eight years, I suppose, since I started my PhD. Um, and I think what was interesting for me is that I kind of uh, went in, you know, when I, when I was doing my PhD, I was not on scholarship. I had to, it felt like a very competitive environment. I didn't get some scholarships that I tried to get. Um, but regardless of that, I had people around me that really kind of looked out for me, I suppose, gave me part-time work in the, in the university, um, created opportunities for me in terms of teaching, research assistant stuff. And uh, then I went and got a part-time job at a polytech. And um, so I had a bit of a different, I suppose, a bit of a different trajectory to kind of what most academics like, well, you know, what most academics really want, I suppose, which is that, you know, tenure track permanent job at the university. Uh, and I actually think I learned a lot from that. And it was really refreshing being kind of outside the university <laughs> at times. Um, yeah, and it, when Marcel... I suppose the other thing I was going to say is that I actually don't really have much of it. I haven't really been paying enough um, attention to what's been happening and I haven't been around long enough to have a kind of like a long-term perspective on that question. But uh, when Marcel did uh, invite me to be involved in this, um, I basically thought of all of the examples of people who had been collegial to me over the last eight years. And the examples I had were just kind of incredible ones. I actually listed them all down, you know, people sharing their teaching resources with me, people forwarding me their CVs and cover letters for jobs. Um, what else did I have down? People helping me with my PBRF portfolio stuff, you know, people sending me the assessments that they use for teaching, um, reviewing my articles, you know, like just the, I suppose the collegiality I experienced really went against that idea that we're all self-centered individuals kind of arsehole academics. I mean, of course they're out there, right? Like, <laughs> of course those douchebags exist. But I suppose I tried to avoid them, I think, and I maybe just naturally did and gravitated towards people who expressed the kind of collegiality and that subjectivity that I, you know, basically wanted to be around. You know, those decent sorts who look out for one another and help where you can. Yeah. That's all I got, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks. Um, and it kind of reminds me, I think, Wendy, when I first met you at all the social movement conferences, you were sort of did an address in which you sort of said you were quite a Pollyanna about some of these things. So it's, I think it's really good to hear some of these positive um, comments because I think it's, it's easy to get sucked into this sort of quite negative um, Con, you know, there, there are aspects of competition to it, but, but it's, it's nice to kind of remember those moments as well. Um, I think what Graydon mentioned is, is, is quite interesting and it, it ties into something Wendy was talking about um, in relation to the very few tenure track jobs that are involved. And, and maybe we can touch on this in, in a later discussion about um, part-time work and the changed nature of work in the academy, that it's, it's not the career as as it would have been, you know, a few years or many years ago when you stepped into something that was going to be 20, 30 years of your life. And I think that idea of being flexible and, and as Wendy said, working across different sectors is much more the reality of academic work today and being open to taking on those um, part-time experiences, um, you know, recognizing that that leaves you open to, to a certain degree of exploitation. Um, and, and maybe some of you in, in the room on screen, would if, if you do have experiences on that to share, I think it might be quite useful to, to broaden the conversation out um, to the changing nature of work in the academy. But before we, we broaden that out, I would like to turn to, to Kim. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, Kim's sort of done quite a, an intense study on um, collegiality and peer relations amongst doctoral students in particular. Morena, um, I probably should start by saying I shouldn't possibly be called doctor yet, but um, because okay. I handed in my thesis, but I don't suffer from imposter syndrome, so I'll live with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, as, as well as the structural change that Wendy indicated about the number of jobs available, another structural change, and especially here at Otago, is that the average age of a doctoral student when they start is 32 years, thereabouts. So I'm a little bit over 32, and um, 
I came into doctoral study expecting collegiality. I'd worked elsewhere in different educational fields and um, that's how I worked with colleagues in, uh, in my professional background. And I came into university expecting to um, find the same experience. And I have to say, by and large, I have. Um, like Braden, I think that collegial people gravitate to one another and, um, and that in itself is a, a very bond, uh, bonding and emboldening experience. Um, like other colleagues on the screen, I've encountered some practices that are less collegial than others, but um, by and large, I, I have been very fortunate with my interactions um, at Otago and have worked with people from all divisions who are extremely giving and um, also very willing to receive collegiality in return. So uh, from a doctoral student perspective, um, in my own research, I have found also that students across divisions are very much um, in favour of reciprocity once they can move beyond the mindset that all they can do while they're here is study for their thesis and get it finished. And that three-year time scale is a huge barrier, I think, for many doctoral students to make the decision to get involved in collegial practices. Thanks so much. I'm just jotting down some notes as Kim is talking. Um, yeah, I mean, I, can I come in on this? Yes, please do. So I think um, I, uh, again, been worrying about the doctoral student experience for quite a long time. And I think it will be a mistake if we think that collegiality is something that happens outside our academic work, that somehow it's the packaging that we put around our academic work. I am deeply worried about the ways in which we uh, socialise people through the PhD process, particularly in the social sciences. Um, so I caricature it. Some of you might have heard me say this before. We shut people in a room all by themselves for three or four years and we make them write a deeply individualised project. And then we let them out and we expect them to be collaborative and collegial subjects. There is very little in the highly individualised PhD process that we currently have that fosters our capacity to be more collaborative academics. Yet, and this was why I was making the points that I made in terms of my opening points, we need these collaborative subjects in today's academy. So one of the really interesting things happening in the UK, for example, is that they're developing these things called doctoral training centres that still don't do away with the thesis, but do a lot of work to develop other kinds of capacities to build those communities, to build those cohorts, to build those capacities that today's academics will need, no matter where they land, whether they land in universities or local government or the private sector. So, so I don't want us to have a conversation about collegiality as the optional extra. I think collegiality has to be a part of how we think about our universities going forward. Thanks. Can I? Uh, sure, Rachel. Yeah. Can I just go on on that? Because um, Kim and I have just been doing some research, uh, we're in the midst of it, um, looking at PhD alumni from American universities and Otago. And we have been asking them specifically about the experiences during the doctoral program, preparation for a range of careers. And uh, one of the things that comes through quite consistently, I think, is the fact that it is an isolating journey. Um, particularly in the social sciences and that desire to get out and meet other people and, and collaborate. And we were really pointedly asking them about a, a set of skills around global citizenship. And they, you know, they did have some good ideas about how to get outside of the office and work with others. Um, so some ideas then, certainly we're seeing the movements in some other countries around trying to foster those sorts of skills. So I think there is hope and we just need to start acting on it here in New Zealand. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, well, both points really about the, the US system, I and mean, that seems to be quite different from how we do it here in the UK, South Africa, other places mm -hmm. as well, um, where there's coursework for a number of years. So that cohort building is fundamentally part of the process from day one, and then they go off and do theses. Whereas here, from day one, you're doing a research project on your own. So 
the research that you've done, um, looking at US and New Zealand, does that come through? Is there a distinct difference between the, the US case? Not no. so far, I don't think. <laughs> Even those going oh. through the cohort system wow. in social science departments are, are commenting about it being isolating. And, and also, some of the role modelling that they do see in their supervisors there is not great either, I think. So um, I think there's more of a challenge in the US because the support for supervisors is far, far less than what they would get here in terms of induction and training. Yeah. Right. So again, it's about the kind of pedagogical approaches. So as someone who went through a North American PhD, you know, the cohorts can be deeply competitive. You know, I, I laid out the stats in terms of, you know, this was the uh, labour market that my Canadian colleagues went into, where in um, not my own field, but a cognate field, there was one job in Canada that year. Mm. And everyone coming out knew there was only the one uh, tenure track job in that particular area. So there's nothing about the cohort, per se, that fosters collaboration. But what kinds of pedagogies, what kinds of capacities can we bring into that setting in order, again, to, to foster different forms of, and I'm using the social science language very unapologetically here, <laughs> to foster different kinds of subjectification, because that's what we need to be thinking about hard, and that's what we need to be doing, in, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Robin, I see you nodding your head vigorously. I just wondered if you had something to add to that. Question. I've got a question. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, sometimes I'm not sure. What, you know, the thing that always come, it feels like it always comes back to, to me, is the, is the structural and financial nature of the university as an institution itself. So we have in this tiny little country, these eight highly competitive universities, and within those universities, we have these these multiple highly competitive faculties that are all, you know, running against each other for this slight resource of, um, of money to run the business. And when you try to do the kinds of things to set up uh, multidisciplinary qualifications or um, work across faculties to develop uh, new opportunities or to reach out to work with um, industry or non-academic sectors, all of those um, all of those kind of counter impulses within, I don't know if you can say this, Wendy, in, inside the subjectivity of the university, you're, you're up against uh, a completely different set of impulses. I mean, it's handy where it's, it's where it's very handy to be a good political economist in a role like mine. So again, what is it that we need to rethink institutionally that would then foster those kinds of differences? So uh, uh, all universities that I'm aware with, of, not just in New Zealand, but there is a, a, a I'll talk specifically about the New Zealand context, but this challenge about how we foster the interdisciplinary working that we know that we need, again, both for research and increasingly for our educational provision, how is it that we change those um, structuring processes like budget setting, like promotions processes, like the ways in which we even all the universities, those are very alive conversations. So what we are seeing, again, if I had uh, more hours in the day, this is a academic paper I'd like to write at one point, the, the sort of layerings of the multiple modes of governance in the university. So the, the marketised university, which is what you're describing, uh, Robin, we all know that that doesn't do the work that we needed to do in order to uh, create the kind of universities that we need for the future. But we're still living with the legacies of that mode of governance at the same time as we try and uh, rethink things for the kind of global civic and disciplinary university. And of course, sitting behind that are more traditional academic modes of governance that haven't gone away either and are part of the story that will use the language very deliberately, the sort of master disciple model of academic governance that uh, 
created a kind of marketised version. I do think we've got a particular challenge in New Zealand. I find myself saying quite often, four and a half million people, we're half the size of the decent space city anywhere else in the world. Uh, I do think that we need to be collaborating more effectively across New Zealand universities. I do think we are beginning to see movements in that direction. Uh, there's lots we could say about the national science challenges, but they are a collaborative gesture and a collaborative effort. Uh, the Centre for Agents of Excellence, something that I've been involved in more recently. Uh, we had all the New Zealand universities in the room at the beginning of that process to have the conversation about how we might work together effectively. So I actually think the will is there. The regulatory and financial settings aren't right for us at the moment in terms of fostering greater collaboration. But we need to be pushing on those things just as we are pushing on other things. So, so again, being, you know, this question about why is it that we need collaboration? Why is it that we need collegiality? And that these are uh, absolutely imperative in terms of creating the universities of the future rather than optional extras is the way we push those regulatory financial barriers in my view. Thanks. Any other comments from the screens and the various rooms that you're in? If you do yeah. have something to say, just give me a wave or jump in. <laughs> Auckland. <laughs> Hello. I'm well hearing the, the PhD experience and just my PhD experience was, was fine and multidisciplinary and collaborative and multinational. Um, the postdoc position, I, in a sense, I think is a much more fragile one then, you know, the PhD, you're enrolled, you're on your journey, and, you know, you either make it or you don't, but it's not, it, it, it's, it has its issues, and certainly not um, uh, undermining them, but the postdoc um, research fellow role with the, you know, the PBRF, entering into the PBRF world, and, you know, having uh, a that you know your value um, being rated on that the short-term contract nature. You know my first postdoc, when I had two-year research fellowship in the UK, and um, then it employed on a particular research project. Then that's what the funding's for. That's what the role is. There's no time or funding for broader uh, um, university engagement and development of of that, it, it can, you know, it can be that way. And or and then when you contract over that research project over any publications, they may come, you know, later on, but you're, there is a, a real fragility in that, in, in an insecurity in terms of, of the nature of those contracts. And I guess, you know, those getting to be judged on your publications and your grants, but, being in an, a university really on a kind of internship and you, you, you're the baby, but you're also expected to be, to be fronting it and getting the publications and the grants to be building. And I think sometimes there are, it's quite, it's a difficult place to be in to kind of step from your PhD into that, making those next steps. So I guess for me, just um, and that some of those roles can be from genuine research roles to basic administration that that someone could be paid half as much to do um, uh, and just sort of finding that place and space in in the university I think the for me that's been a much that's more challenging than the PhD journey itself so just yeah really raising that postdoc window space there that um, uh, has its, uh, its own issues. Yeah, so, so advance um, notice of a piece of work that I am going to sponsor together with the um, Centres of Research Excellence is we want to, so again, the 
the, the data that I was using earlier, and I was saying we don't have good New Zealand data in this space, because there are, as I think we're all aware, some specificities about the New Zealand environment, both in terms of the composition of our PhD cohorts, where we have, um, sort of for a country of our um, ilk, we have large numbers of, or relatively speaking, large numbers of international PhD students. Uh, so their, their journey looks different, speaking to someone who is also an international PhD student, uh, but also because the postdoc space looks different to the space in bigger, better resourced sectors. So that question about the ways in which, again, the fact that we are positioned in a very specific way in a globalising sector has labels implications, and that has implications not just in terms of uh, transnationalism, but it has implications across different sectors. Uh, who's mobile, who's not? This is a profoundly gendered question. Uh, it also has implications for Māori Pacific researchers who may well be more rooted in place for all sorts of um, intellectual and community reasons. So we want to get inside that and do some um, inclusive work on the early career labour force in the New Zealand context to understand more specific what it looks like for us here in order to be able to think harder about the ways in which we might uh, support accordingly. I've already had a lot of people in my ear saying, oh, we need more postdoc funding. Well, that may or may not be the solution. I want a much stronger sense of what the problem is before we begin to think about what the solutions might look like above and beyond the, um, can we get some more resources into the sector? So, so watch the space in terms of that. <laughs> I wonder if I could just turn to Kim here. I mean, I, I recognise that your work was really on, on um, mm -hmm. collegial peer learning amongst doctoral uh, students and in, within doctoral education, but I wonder if there's something you know, that you found in your research that you think could translate into that postdoc space. Sure. Um, well, one, one important factor was that actually doctoral students consider a huge range of people colleagues. So they actually talked about people in the um, well, people in their collegial activity as colleagues. That that came up, and it sort of replaced the word peer because um, peers could be other academics within the university, people within the digital communities um, that students were a part of. It could be members of the community, family members, friends, other students. So people saw a huge range of others as their colleagues and colleagues came and went. They didn't necessarily have to be long lasting relationships, but it was very much about um, being able to work purposely with other people, either as a support for someone else or as the recipient of that collegiality. And fundamentally, mm -hmm. I found that there were four types of collegiality, which was um, intellectual collegiality, professional collegiality, social collegiality and emotional collegiality and I guess out of all of those the emotional collegiality was the biggest surprise for me from the data in that not only do people get a lot of intellectual help or professional development or uh, you know social support but actually that collegiality was incredibly important for people's sense of well-being and feeling part of a community, even though relationships, as I said, could be quite fleeting, um, <coughs> gave, gave people a sense of social solidarity and um, just knowing that other people were looking out for them or you knowing that they could support someone else when needed. Mm -hmm. I think there's an interesting tension there about you know, the time frame and then establishing emo an emotional relationship with someone. Because mm. often those things happen over time. Yeah. But the light in the life of a PhD student, I mean, they're not all there at the same time. They're coming and going. Three years is not a very long time. So I don't know if you want to sort of say more about what, you know, the, these dimensions of emotional collegiality. What, what is that really about? Well, and, and I think at Otago, because we have a monthly intake of doctoral students. So, you know, really, you may not ever be a part of a cohort um, here in, in the same sense that you might be in other universities and especially um, international ones. So... Um, 
what I found was that people did engage in relationships with others with a very tacit set of expe expectations. And, and one was that, you know, you would interact in a trusting way, that, um, that you would reciprocate. So an expectation of reciprocity, even if it was a some point in the future, someone might help me out. <laughs> um, that, that was a really s strong value that people had. And, um, but it was never shared. It was completely operating on a tacit level. And so in terms of the kinds of pedagogies and um, provision that we can make for doctoral students, it is about creating a platform for relationship building where some of these more tacit expectations can and just can be supported in their evolution I, because otherwise we'll be left with the collegial people interacting with other collegial people and those people whose language or cultural differences um, you know don't readily equate can be left left on the sidelines although interestingly almost half of my participants were international students mm -hmm. so um, I also don't want to make assumptions about particular types of students who have collegial values because it did very much seem to be across disciplines, across gender, across, um, you know, people's uh, identified ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just pick up on that creating a platform and getting back to the point that somebody at Auckland made about um, postdocs and that postdoc space. Um, something that really struck me, um, I was recently hosted at the University of California, Berkeley, and they had a fantastic postdoc program, and part of that was a, there was a um, humanities and social science network, and so people and they defined postdoc really broadly. So it was basically anyone who was a visitor or in a formal postdoc position or teach, you know post PhD anyway, whatever position that might be. And that was a really neat network that we're getting together on a monthly basis, and it did help provide that support and getting out of the offices in that sort of post-PhD space. So really terrific program, mm. I thought. Yeah. Because yeah. so I think post -doc, professional development for postdocs falls through the cracks in a lot of places, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, often they sort of get tacked onto a department to raise the number of publications, you know, some, some coming fresh off a PhD, they, they've got something there that they can produce from. And I think we've sort of seen that around um, departments, university departments around the world. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that um, both Graydon and Kim mentioned about reciprocity. And we can go beyond the panelists if you want to share some of your thoughts about um, reciprocity, because, you know, the sort of, um, the implicit thing about reciprocity is also a question about trust and who, who you trust and, and um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I'd just like to invite some thoughts on, on the issue of, of trust and reciprocity. What goes around comes around. <laughs> so my observation would be, if I get a um, I feel like I have had very strong collegial and mentoring support over the years, people who gave to me without, at crucial points in my career without any expectation, this is kind of what Graydon was saying, but I'm just sort of underline it, without any necessary expectation that there would be direct reciprocity. But if you have that kind of behaviour role modelled to you, if you like, and back to that, RNZ interview, my friends will be giving me a really hard time because I said I turned into an old fashioned liberal feminist because I really believed in role models. But I really believe in <laughs> you, know, so if you, you know, you think about all the people who have supported you, shared teaching materials, supported your job applications, helped you with the mock interviews, given you some advice about things you might like to do. And you won't do it back then, but you can do it for others. Mm -hmm. And that's the culture we need to create in our universities, that sense of what goes around comes around, that it's not a, um instrumental or self-interested uh, relationship that we're, we're trying to foster here. It is about creating the kind of climate in which these things are seen as normal. And we are all in this together. The, the notion that academic work is only about a, a single smart individual who's got all these great ideas in their head is nonsense. 
And, you know, the, 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 the more that we can make that very clear that it's through our engagements with others that we all become better, that both as academics and that our institutions will become better. You know, you can tell, I feel really, really strongly about it. What goes around comes around, and that selflessness is actually in the interests of us all. So it is self it's self-interested, but it's a collective self-interest, not an individual self-interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I quite like that idea. It's obviously a very sociological point about creating a new normal through everyday behaviour. And I think mm. sometimes, you know, we sort of expect that these things are going to come from the outside. We're going to get some definition of what collegiality is, and somehow have to subscribe to it. But I, th I think you're right that it's in it's in the everyday, and and having students, PhD students, even undergrad students around us, seeing that generosity, and that it's not always going to be a give and take. Um, you know, equal in equal measure. Well, and that we perform being an academic in, in self-conscious kinds of ways because our students are watching us. They do learn from us. Um, our early career folks, um, you know, you're listening hard today. The, the kinds of ways in which we are uh, role models, you know, again, to be very clear about that, it's really important. And I think we need to be a little bit more self-conscious about that than we currently are, which is, you know, the, the Pollyanna, you know, I joke about myself and the Pollyanna, but there is something about having some optimism about what's possible in our university, otherwise people are going to walk away from our institutions. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if I can just expand this discussion and look specifically at the question of, um, about collegiality across disciplines. I mean, I recognize that we've got people in the room beyond social sciences. And, and maybe if you can share some of your experiences working outside of the usual frame of social sciences, you know, is, is there a difference um, in, in what we understand to be collaboration in those different disciplines? And then I've also got a question um, just over the text. This is why I'm, I'm not really skilled in this whole art of um, multitasking, but it's a question that comes in from Becky Kittle, who's not on screen, but is in the discussion. Um, and it's specifically a question about interdisciplinarity. And uh, I might just sort of read the question. Becky's wanting to know, to, well, she says that there's a, a lot of rhetoric in university circles about interdisciplinary collaboration, but the metrics by which our academic value is measured, for example, PBRF, ultimately privilege disciplinary experts that spit out a lot of publications. And, and then she's sort of saying, notwithstanding, Wendy, you might want to talk more about this, um, the, the, the great new promotion scheme that you have developed at Vic. You might want to tell us all about this. <laughs> we seem, we're all excited to hear about it, that values interdisciplinarity and community engagement. So where we can start, maybe just from people who aren't social scientists, you've experienced something different, and then we'll go into this question about interdisciplinarity. Oh, I'll, I'll add something to that. Thanks. Uh, so um, my, um, I, I undertook a PhD by creative practice um, at RMIT in Melbourne. Um, and um, that was, there was people from lots of different disciplines and working together in that environment. So there was um, architects and urban designers, but there were also artists and dancers and jewelers and, and all sorts of people. So that was sort of an inherent through it. Um, and I think that was a great thing. But just really to, um, I think it was it's really interesting what Becky's said, because I've had the same experience where a lot of the work that I've done, which is um, to do with making exhibitions or making public events, includes a huge amount of people in it and they're from outside the university sector as well as inside it. Um, but the, the creative practice research has impacts that are, um, you know, transformative of, of particular places and particular neighbourhoods. But I really struggle to have the complexity of that work recognised in a PBRF environment where the sole authored book or journal is the thing that is valued. Um, and I've had really, I mean, I found it a really difficult process, PBRF, this time around because um, a lot of that work um, has included non-academics, it's included students and the projects, 
And I've been, you know, told outright, well, you know, you can't, it doesn't really have value in, in this effectively what is an auditing process. Um, PBRF is only an auditing process and it's only that kind of valuation. It's not, it's not talking about other kinds of value. But I do see that if I was interested in, um, you know, uh, 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 being, advancing my career, if that was really my only interest, then I would really back away from that kind of work. Um, and, and do other kinds of work. And I, I should have added at the beginning, one of the reasons I joined this discussion was because I read Graydon's PhD as part of my own PhD work. Um, although we've never met, we don't know each other. But, um, um, and I'm really interested in some of the um, processes that he documented in his PhD to do with um, ways of that, that uh, well, he would obviously explain it better, but um, to do with things like time banking and, and all those sorts of processes. I'm just wondering whether, as we come to review PBRF, which you know our, the TEUs just here in Auckland just invited us to the first sort of discussion about the future of PBRF, led by the government conversation about it. I'm just wondering whether we can, as a as a sector, really reformulate that auditing to value the other things that we're talking about. Especially the things that Wendy's been talking about with the um, Global Civic University, you know, there's a whole different set of values and a whole di different set of contributions articulated in that form of university that just are not um, really valued through the auditing process that we currently have, and which, of course, is then mirrored in things like the promotion process. I think it's a really practical question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, okay, I, I might, yeah, Wendy and then Graydon. Yeah, so I think, um, I think we need to be thoughtful about this. So uh, my experience of sitting on both PBRE panels and the Research Excellence Framework panels in the UK, and I'm now on the uh, main panel C for the 2021 exercise in the UK. So I've got quite a lot of experience on these uh, audit panels, it, it, it is the right way to think about them, uh, is that uh, they do grapple with interdisciplinarity much more effectively than I think many academics think they do. So I think we're very risk averse often in our school and disciplinary discussions around this. My experience of the panels is that they're not nearly as risk averse as the internal conversation. So that's the the first point I would want to make. The second point I would want to make is that we are all all about quality, not quantity. So the cookie cutter model of, you know, I'm going to do something safe that's mainstream in the discipline and just, you know, churn it out, doesn't travel, doesn't travel well, especially doesn't travel well in the context of the global civic university. So if people are giving you that advice, I, I think I would want to think hard about it. But thirdly, and perhaps more importantly, as we review PBRF, the interesting thing about the REF framework is it had this category called impact, uh, both in the previous exercise and in the forthcoming exercise. And impact is that question of what difference does our research make beyond the academy? Now, in the UK, again, there was quite a lot of worry about that when it was first introduced, that it would be narrowly economistic and it would only be work for those people who produce widgets that, you know, make lots of money. But, and, and I tell this story over and over again, and it's in the public domain, but it's really important, our job is behind the international movement to the living wage. So one of the four star, which was the highest award that you could get, impact case studies on the Geography Red Panel in the last Red Exercise in the UK was the invention of the living wage, Jane Wills and the London Citizens Movement, out of which this grew. So as we have these conversations about the reforming of PBRF, I think it'll be really important that we create elbow room for those wider conversations about these more engaged forms of scholarship that are increasingly, again, what global civic universities are looking for, the kinds of opportunities that many academic colleagues are looking for, that we will need an audit process that 
fashion in more holistic ways this kind of work, recognizing that it's not straightforward, it's time consuming, it's not linear, it's premised on deep relationships. You know, you will know this, but we're going to have to keep saying this over and over again. So I think this is exactly the kind of conversation that we all need to be having as New Zealand begins to rethink PBRF is the question of how it is that we have an exercise that better captures the more holistic nature of being an academic. And again, just to circle right back, that's what we try to do with the new VIP promotions process. The framework's on the web. You can find it if you want to have a look and see what it uh, does. But we've got a whole host of new indicators in each of our four categories, research, learning and teaching, external engagement and hotukonga uh, leadership, uh, that try and capture in a much more holistic way the nature of being an academic today. Thanks, Wendy. And I think uh, some of this, these ideas on creating elbow room about what knowledge matters and how it matters, I think, ties in quite nicely to some of the work that Graydon has done on um, alternative economies, community economies, and alternative ways of counting and seeing, you know, alternative knowledges or epistemologies, I think, is, is important to bring into this conversation as well. But I might just turn over to Graydon just to, um, to, to think about how your, your PhD work could, to, could tie into this. Thanks, Marcel. I love that someone read my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really interesting hearing you talk because one of the things that the artists, um, the artists that I was working with in my PhD were saying, how do we evaluate the impact of the projects we're doing? We, do, you know, we, we are the artists. We come up with the ideas. We facilitate the process. So this was social art process, guys. So it's not like kind of a painting or a sculpture. It was kind of more social, social projects that I was looking at. Um, yeah, so that was the question they were grappling with. And some of these were academics, some of them were community practitioners. Um, and so lots of what I was doing with them was working out a way we could kind of, uh, kind of analyze the effects of the, the projects that they were doing. So it was really, it was kind of a really, it was, I really found it useful because it helped shift me out of the kind of usual social science mode of thinking about the world and thinking about, you know, stuff and kind of into that more creative like a, like a discipline that I hadn't really, you know, disciplines that I hadn't really uh, worked in before. So it was a really good example of, um, yeah, when things work. And so that, for me, that led to um, publications um, based, on, based on their work, which was also useful for them because it kind of, you know, it was meant that they could then say, someone's written about my work, someone's, you know, there's an audience, all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing I was just thinking about is that what I've been noticing recently is the way grant applications and funding processes, like the imperative of collaboration is kind of moving into that stuff. So um, some colleagues and I got a, we got a National Science Challenge grant and they kind of basically said we got it because we were one of the few people who had an existing relationship with the community group who could get started and get the project happening, you know, quickly in the one and a half years. So, and that was kind of interesting because it was the first time for me that that has been recognized by a funder as valuable. And so I thought that was cool. And I think that's an example of like what Wendy has been talking about, like shift, kind of shifting yeah. those um, governance and institutional funding measures. Yeah. 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 Thanks. That's, that's a fantastic example, Graydon. Um, are there any more thoughts on this? There are a number of things that have come up over um, the group chat by text but I don't want to cut anybody off if you had anything to add to this specific point. All good. Okay. So the, the three things that have come up, one around technology, one on gender and one on hierarchies. Um, and, and I think I, I do want to touch on, on all of these because I think they're quite important. Robin's asked a question about um, the gendered nature of collegiality. And certainly from my own experience in my own department, I think this is it's a very real thing that we're having to confront. Somebody earlier spoke about the glue or the, you know, the sort of social glue that holds us all together. And, and, and that is, it brings in a very gendered dimension of who is the glue. Um, so maybe if we can comment on that. And I think, uh, I, I can't see that Jacob is with us, but he might be with us just in audio. He asked a question about hierarchical dimensions of collaboration. Hello, Jacob. Um, you might just, if you, if you want to, you can maybe expand um, on, on what you mean 
by, by that. And then the third question um, uh, from Siobhan is around technology and collegiality and um, in the face of online communication interaction. Where does sure, that leave? I can jump in with my, my saying there. So okay. within collaboration, it's interesting, just follows on from Graydon's point actually. Certainly from where I sit um, in a local government, you know, there's a certain weariness about universities approaching approaching us and wanting to collaborate. Um, <laughs> oh no, what do they want now? You know, what, is, <laughs> what do they want to do with our access to communities or, or the kind of the kind of things that we do get? And what do we get back? Where is that re reciprocity? And we'll often go into a, a journal article or certainly someone's own, uh, someone's, you know, career advancement on on, on that. Um, often, we we don't necessarily see that, um, and it's it's been it's been interesting since I've started here to sort of um, experience that firsthand, and also just the real weariness. And I think you know there's a lot of communities who have that weariness around collaborating. Um, indigenous communities globally would be one that springs to mind. So um, I think you know collaboration. I mean, I think one of the interesting things in this conversation for me is almost the way collaboration and collegiality have been collapsed together, and I think. I don't, I don't know if they go so um, so smoothly. And certainly in the Me Too era, you know, all these sort of collaborative um, people, we've been the most kind of progressive and left-wing directors and all these others have been kind of outed as, you know, uh, uh, serial abusers. So I think, and it comes, you know, I guess that relates, relates to Robin's point about that gender dynamic um, often within, within this. So that, that's sort of where I was, where I was thinking. I'd be interested to hear what anyone else thinks. Thanks. Any comment and response? So I think that's, so I think the point about uh, collaboration, collegiality, not collapsing them into each other is a really good point. And I think that's really helpful. So let me talk first about collaboration and then about collegiality. So I think you're right, the imperative to build those cross-sectorial relationships to be successful in the kinds of um, changing funding environment that, that Graydon was gesturing towards. Uh, it's really important that those are understood as relationships and not instrumentalised and aren't one way. And again, I think the social sciences understand a lot about this. Uh, but so too do disciplines like engineering, for example, where there's been a lot of um, professional academy relationships for a long way. They've got to be two-way, they've got to work for both. It will mean uh, a diversity of outputs because a academic output is not the same as a practitioner output. It will drive the conversation about open access much more sharply than it has been driven to date, and that is not just open access to outputs, but that's open access to data, and that will be a, a really tough conversation in the New Zealand context because of the, the questions around data sovereignty and Indigenous data and the like. But there's a whole lot of things that this uh, sea change moment begin to open up that are really, really important. Uh, again, I was part of a, a major cross-research council initiative called the Connected Communities Programme in the UK before I came back to New Zealand, which was precisely about all of these issues. And there's some great outputs, both academic outputs and practitioner outputs that are coming out of that wider programme of work that are grappling with many of these issues, including, to kind of circle back to an earlier conversation, What's quality in this space? So we know what quality looks like in terms of conventional academic outputs. It's the, the high-profile journal article or the monograph or whatever. But what's quality in this deeply collaborative, uh, co-produced, co-designed space, the kind of space that Graydon was working in? How do we get our heads around that? So again, all sorts of new questions that begin to flow. In terms of collegiality, it is often deeply gendered. Uh, it is often, uh, 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 I don't know what the right language for this is, but I think my Maori and Pacifica colleagues are often much more deeply collegial and supportive of each other than, than other communities within the university. What we try to do with the revised promotions process at Victoria 
was make all of that visible. So some of our variables, if you, or some of our indicators are collegiate, collegiality indicators. Because women often do the domestic, uh, it's sort of the equivalent of the domestic labor. Women do the emotional labor, our institutional emotional labor. Not always, but often. So then how do we make that visible? How do we make that pastoral work visible? How do we make that uh, collegiality, to use the term that we're using this morning, how, how do we make that visible? So people can say, this is an integral part of what I do. This is part of my institutional contribution. Not an optional extra, it is integral to what I do. And we make that visible. And again, my hope is that by making it visible, we normalise it as an expectation of everyone, not just some of us. So can I just pick up on that, Wendy? I mean, I think it's a great uh, way to move. Um, I think the proof will be whether somebody who is very uncollegial, but a top researcher, uh, will get promoted in your system. Absolutely, and we did it at Bristol, right? So, so you know, this isn't a, a new conversation for me. Uh, we decided it didn't matter how stellar a researcher you were, if you weren't making those wider institutional contributions, we were not going to promote you. And promotions committees have to have the gumption to have those hard conversations because academics start paying attention when they get the promotion letter back that says, well, yes, we can see your research output's stellar, but you're not teaching very much. And other than serving on the, the lowest stress committees that you can find, you're not making those wider how to come to engagement contributions. So the onus is back on us, people like us, Rachel, who sit on the committees who are making these kinds of decisions. And cultural change that gives rise to change in institutional processes. But it requires university leaders to also walk the walk around this and in some cases make some hard decisions. Yeah. How refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it kind of, in a way, it raises a question then, do, do people just do something because it's a tick box, or do they really value the, the role of, of that in, in what we're doing? And, and I'm sort of, you know, envisioning what would happen in our department where people go, oh, all of a sudden there's new criteria, well, now I'm going to start ticking these boxes. Yeah. You know, whereas there are other people who recognise that even if it doesn't count, it is important. Yeah, there's that I, sort of. I, I joke about hitting people with carrots. <laughs> right, carrots stick, you know, hit them with carrots. Um, I like it. But yes, we will never get round. You know, some people will will you know just be completely um, expedient and instrumental around this. But 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 we're shifting the conversation, uh, yeah. which will shift the culture, which will shift our institutional processes which will make it harder for those people to be completely self-serving and instrumental. Yeah. Can, I, can I come back to Jacob's point about um, hierarchies and relationships with communities? Because I have, was part of a team that looked at uh, community engagement with um, colleagues across the university. And those hierarchies of power between the academy and community partners um, were definitely a part of the, um, of the process. and, and I, I can empathise with his concerns about, well, what do they want out of us, as you know, which is not really a partnership at all, but more of a one-sided giving relationship. Um, but there was some really interesting rela um, research done uh, by Māori colleagues around how universities evaluate how they have conducted themselves as partners um, using kōpapa approaches. And, and I think that, you know, if collegiality is also about engagement and partnerships then actually the institution needs to be far more reflective of how it conducts itself for collegiality to actually sustain as opposed to being this time limited um, function really yeah. yeah that's an important point um robin i might just want to bring you in here it touches on something that wendy said but also a comment that you made online about um quality and how we evaluate that and you'd mentioned something specific about um building actively building and rebuilding our understanding of what evaluative judgment can bring so if i if i can draw you in here please thanks marcella the um one of the things that really troubles me is that in many university contexts we understand 
evaluation to be about um, working out how we assess students when they do their stuff. Um, and we don't have evaluate leaders in our universities who are saying, we're doing this, how do we know that what this is has quality? So what Victoria is doing with their new promotions criteria is absolutely fantastic. Um, we need to follow that up with uh, the kind of evaluation that enables the behaviour change to be tracked and understood. Um, and we have a very underdeveloped um, respect, I suspect, is the word I'm looking for, for the for evaluation as an academic activity or an intellectual exercise or or a um, a robust set of skills. And just thinking about our engineering colleague up at Auckland there, you know, the, thing, the thing that I really admire about engineering is that they are constantly in the process of evaluating everything they do from in, the, in that process of building a design and applying it and seeing if it uh, literally stands up in the world. And my sense is that um, in this new collegial environment, we need to be really thinking a lot more about how, how to evaluatively judge the value of collegiality so that we can build transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity and um, less gendered workplaces and all of those things that drive us a little crazy. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, so not just um, making the change, but also how we evaluate that change and knowing whether it's having its desired um, outcome, because there's, I think we've all seen too much of the change for change's sake happening. Um, any thoughts on that about how we evaluate um, any of these measures for change? So I don't, I think it's a really good question and I don't think it's easy. So again, uh, this is about collaboration and impact, not collegiality per se. But I think it's very striking that both the Brits and the Australians are using case study methodologies to look at impact. Mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, if we metricize, which of course is what PDRF encourages us to do, is metricize, we will never uh, get our heads around this more qualitative kind of um, uh, context that, that we are exploring this morning. So again, it's one of the reasons why I'm very interested to watch the discussions around the revision of PBRE. Um, uh, my view is still feeling sort of relatively new back is that we are overly metricizing here. Uh, so I think the emphasis on peer review is really important in this conversation or in this kind of context. Uh, but again, I think we'll have to push that uh, because I think otherwise alt metrics will become the way in which we capture this. Thanks. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left and um, just in, in those last 10 minutes, I just wanted to come back to the question about technology. Um, you know, where, where does it aid collaboration and where does it actually hinder? Um, that, that establishing of trusting human relationships. And it's a question that's come up over the group chat. But also, um, you know, Robin's reminded us of this, exactly what we're doing here is aided by technology. Um, and it, it's, you know, ESOC SI is probably one of the um, most successful examples of that where, you know, in, in a relatively small country, it's quite difficult to get up and down the country at, at low cost. Um, so to have a, a, a facility like this where, we, we can connect across these spaces, I think is really valuable. And to keep this going, we obviously do need um, funding. So I'm just putting that out there. Speak to your universities um, to, to keep this project going. I think, um, you know, for, for, for Karen and Sophie and I, running the, this particular um, network has been one of, one of the, the highlights that we've had in, um, in, in our careers. It's been very valuable to, to connect in this way when you can't always do it face to face. But I wonder if people have any thoughts on that about, um, you know, the, the uses and abuses of technology in facilitating um, collaborative relationships. 
we could talk a little bit about that. I've run a couple of um, national projects, uh, one around inquiry-based learning, one on graduate outcomes, and we did have multi-institutions involved in that across the country, and the technology was a fantastic enabler. Um, having said that, it was also a value to initially at least get together face-to-face -to, -face to try and help build those relationships, and then once, once we knew each other, we were then very comfortable using a number of online environments like web conferencing for regular meetings, digital platforms to, you know, develop the, the data, you know, data protocols and share results and so forth. So I think it can be a huge enabler for collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think also um, in, in light of a lot of students studying at a distance, that's sort of where these things can come in as well, not to only have them at distance, but to have a physical face-to-face mm -hmm. -face interspersed with, with them being away. As we've already noticed, it's a, noted, it's a very, can be a very isolating thing to, to, to do a PhD. And if you're doing it at a distance, it makes it even more challenging. Um, I mean, this really, it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we wanted to discuss today. But I, um, before I just throw out some more thoughts, does anybody want to say anything else about technology? Um, and uh, Siobhan, you had a question about open access, which I think Wendy has touched on a little bit. I don't know if you wanted to raise that further. Uh, no, I just I just happened to be typing that simultaneously as she was talking to her. <laughs> and, and then went, oh, she's answering it beautifully. So <laughs> I, I, I like to think great minds think alike. <laughs> um, but but on the technology base, particularly, I'd be curious on Kim, because we're grappling with some research that we're doing around um, supporting postgraduate and early career researchers at the library and we're kind of grappling with this issue around um, the the desire or the preference for face-to-face -face. and we know within ourselves that we build up really good collegial relationships with our postgrad students with face-to-face -face, but the need for, in terms of scaling our support, the mm. need to use particularly the asynchronous online options. Mm. And they, and, and I can kind of see that they may be great for, you know, in terms of spreading thin resources around. But I'm also thinking that they might not actually be particularly enabling for building collegiality kind of relationships. I was wondering if Kim in particular might be able to touch on that. Um, well, not greatly, unfortunately, because most of the students who took part in my study, and, um, and there were 43, most were not members of digital communities. They were very much around face-to-face. -face. And those who were involved in digital communities connected to their discipline um, were ardent active members. So, um, I mean, it's, it's tricky. I think some of it is, again, how we, we configure the, the learning day for doctoral students, bearing in mind that maybe a lot more students need contact after the nine to five hours and, and using technologies interactively in the evenings as well. And I'm not, I'm not sure how that functions at Otago, but I do have a friend who's currently doing a postgraduate course at Vic and her course, you know, her classroom interactions are online um, early evening after the working day. And I think for students of, who have multiple responsibilities, as I said, lots of doctoral students are now older, lots are international and, um, you know, um, having reconfiguring the, um, the academic day might be a way that we have to think about functioning and having colleagues who start later in the day and finish and don't come in during the hours of nine to five. So I think we need to think about this as an international conversation as well. So mm. again, how can we uh, use technology as a facilitator to build those wider opportunities and networks and conversations that we need to be part of here? So I just put that one out there as well. Um, you know, things have come a long way. I can remember the first time I examined a PhD by Skype and it was a disaster because my university didn't support Skype and I ended up doing, doing the examiner on my cell phone. It was, just, you know, just look at the, you know, what we're doing here this morning and then if we sort of amplify that in terms of the ways in which other national but actually international 
uh, conversations and collaborations can be built through this medium, either within the curriculum or around the curriculum, I think that's really important for us to be thinking about. Yeah. Any other comments um, on, on this point? I'm just aware of time and being aware of how, you know, we're going to be pulled in all sorts of directions in the next five um, minutes. But I do want to give a chance to people who might not have spoken yet, or if you have any last thoughts. Amanda. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> need your mic on. Can you put the mic on? Oh, is that working? Now you're now on. You're on. Ah, good. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of buttons. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I said thank you. I've really been enjoying everyone's contributions. Um, and I've been aware that we've been talking, as people noted, across collegiality and collaboration, which aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, we've been talking a lot about ways to facilitate interactions through structures. And I think where I wanted to just come back to was, was thinking about my own experience, but also what I've witnessed with colleagues, is that we can have amazing structures, we can have fantastic technology, uh, we can have all sorts of different activities that might foster particular practices. But if we don't trust our colleagues, if we don't <laughs> trust our institutions, if we don't have faith that there is equity, if we don't have faith that there is justice, if we don't have faith that we can be heard, and respected, then really nothing really matters. So I think it's very interesting that we've worked and we've talked a lot in the realm of the rational today around structures and around sort of disciplinary practices. And there hasn't been as much mention, it's been in there around uh, the emotional dimensions, the heart, the fragility of many of us who are juggling very complex lives, who are grappling with things we care de deeply about. And so how do we create space for the messiness? How do we create space for the vulnerability? How do we create space to hold each other when we're struggling? And I think that really is the test of how our institutions work, is how they make space for our humanity. I'll just leave it there. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think that um, it, it sort of opens up a, a, a terrain for a whole nother conversation. And, and you know, after this, uh, uh, Karen and Sophie and I will have a chat about how we can, can maybe develop a, a workshop around that particular theme to, to continue this conversation. I do just want to also acknowledge Sandy, who's come in over text about, um, you know, being precariously employed and, and this question of, you know, collegiality, sort of one more thing that now is pulling people in, in a direction um, and, you know, sort of balancing all of these demands in, in this context of, of having to normalize collegiality. And I think I just, you know, want to reiterate a point um, that, that Wendy said right at the beginning about, um, or well, Wendy might not have said it in these words, but it's what I took from Wendy's message about, you know, collegiality not being a thing on a tick box that's a separate thing to do but it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a way of being. So, mm. so to me, I see it more as a, a to be rather than a, a to do. Um, and, and this might sort of tie into Sarah's point about, um, you know, being in an environment where that sort of humanity can flourish. You know, if we've got to sit and identify the tick box items of, of humanity, then that's pretty sad if that's sort of the point that we've got to you know, thinking about it, something that we actively must do rather than just who we are. Um, but I do recognize that those who are um, precariously employed um, have a whole other set of, of factors that they, that they or, or, or directions that they're being pulled in, that insecurity of not knowing when the next job is going to be. And, and I mean, I think Wendy's highlighted quite brilliantly the, the ratio you know, of, of um, 
students versus tenure track jobs there. So, so yeah, lots, lots to think about. But I, I, I really do want to thank all our speakers for being involved in this conversation and for, um, for throwing some of this, the positive spin on it, because I really do agree with Wendy. I've kind of come, you know, from a very negative space um, to in the, in the last sort of three years of thinking about if, if we're just going to sit around trashing this place, <laughs> It's not, it's not going to continue to exist. And it's one of the, um, the, the most incredible spaces, I think, to work. Um, it does have its problems. But, um, but I think some of the, the sort of positive ideas on what, what we can actually do in this space give me a lot of hope um, to, you know, to, to realize that, the, that this is something we, we can actually change the institution from, from within. Um, so if there aren't if, if any closing comments from our panelists, been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it. Um, one of the things that um, John Hood used to say when he was the VC at Auckland was, we are our university. So it's not that the university is out there. We are our university. So, and, and that really stayed with me as, at the time, a relatively early career person. So if we want our universities to be different, we need to hold them and understand that we are our university. So, um, uh, yeah, just leave it at, at, at that. So, yeah, let me leave it at that. Thank you so much. Uh, Graydon, anything by way just of closing? One thing. Yeah, I was just thinking, Sandy, really good point there about this, this other thing that we have to add to our to-do list. Um, in terms of my own reflections on my working life, I have basic, managers have told me I've basically got a, every job I've got is because I seem like an easy person to work with. <laughs> you know, like, so my research was fine, yeah, 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 I, had, I kind of had the right experience, I suppose, but what it came down to for them was that I just seemed like, you know, someone they could get along with and wasn't kind of drama. Um, <laughs> so, so in a way, we could think of it as one more thing to add to the list of things, but we could also think of it as if we cultivate that within ourselves, a collegial orientation to others, that actually puts us, that actually enables us to get the next job, to get the next I mean, that's been, yeah, I don't know. That's just some thought. So rather than thinking about a negative thing, it's, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Marcel, it was great. Thank you, Graydon. And, and Kim? Yeah, I'd just like to echo Sarah's point. I mean, amongst the doctoral students who I worked with for my research, um, trust was by far the most important aspect of collegiality that they identified, followed by communication. So, um, you know, achieving trust by being um, feeling able to communicate to people openly and, and in a safe way. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. As, as I said, I mean, sort of touched, you know, it's just that really the tip of the iceberg. I had a whole long list of questions that I, mm -hmm. that I put out to, to the panelists, including the issue about, um, you know, in, in what ways does collegiality impact on robust academic debate? And I think that's one of the things I found in, in the New Zealand context. So for those who don't know, I'm from, from South Africa and, and we used to have very robust, very hairy debates and still be able to walk out of it and go down to the, to, to the pub and have a, have a drink. Whereas here on one of the first occasions, it was a staff meeting, not a seminar. I was very quickly told New Zealanders don't like conflict. And, and I mean, I wasn't having a conflict with the person. It was an idea that I was contesting. And, and so I think, you know, there's some issues around there about um, what is collegial robust debate versus an outright conflict, but unfortunately we've run out of time, so this will have to be for, for a whole another session. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, again, just to, to thank all the panelists for taking part. Um, I, I recognize that everybody is really busy, and thank you to everybody who's um, spared the time to, to join us today and share your comments online um, and also on screen. It's been a fantastic debate, and we, we hope to see you at the next ESOC-SI early career and postgrad panel.